Welcome back to Virtual Bubonicon 52. We now have a panel that is, uh, yay, I'm immortal, now what? Uh, so to lead this discussion, I hand it off to Ian Tregellis, who I believe sadly is not immortal. I am not, but I'm totally okay with that. And maybe we'll get into that during the panel. Um, hi, everybody. This is Book Bubonicon 52, version 2.0. Um, our stellar panelists are in reverse alphabetical order, Courtney Willis, Susan Matthews, Emily Ma, and Lou Berger. So for the next 55 minutes, they're going to apply their wit, their charm, and their erudition to a dream that is as old as humanity. That is, of course, immortality. And uh, as Bandy said, I'm your moderator, Ian Tregillis. So panelists, I'd like to invite you to briefly introduce yourselves to our audience. And when you're doing that, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on whether or not you would like to become immortal. Um, you know, if, if someone walked up to you and offered you the chance at immortality, true immortality, as in never dying, would you take them up on it? So uh, let's start with Courtney. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my name's Courtney Willis. Uh, I was a high school science teacher for 23 years and then a midlife crisis took me back to school. Connie preferred that to a red convertible and a new girlfriend. <laughs> and I finished up at the University of Wyoming. And uh, I taught in the physics department at University of Northern Colorado for 29 years. Um, and uh, I don't think I'd like true immortality forever. Interesting, we'll, we'll get back to that. And that. Susan? Hi, my name is Susan Matthews. I just finished a fantasy novel, uh, the second of three, um, about a young man uh, who was raised in a Rajput household in Northwestern India in about 1840. Um, this novel includes a character who is an immortal. Uh, Chinese immortals tend to have a beginning, but no end. Um, and, the, and the character I'm uh, borrowing, exploiting for the particular novel um, is uh, based on a cultural, an historical figure and a cultural figure in China uh, frequently referred to as the Chinese Merlin. And the thing that makes me interested in listening to and participating in this panel is that he's the kind of immortal who's forgotten that he is immortal. This happens a lot in some Hindu literature. Wow, fascinating. Fascinating. Emily. Uh, so I'm Emily Ma Tippetts and um... So in Bubonicon, I'm Emily Ma. That's the name I write science fiction and fantasy under. Um, then I also write contemporary as E.M. Tippetts. Um, and I have written about immortals. Um, none of my immortals are unkillable. Um, they just theoretically could live forever if they did not meet their demise in some, you know, being killed in some sort of accident or, or injury. Um, but I, I think what I kind of bring to the panel is... Um, when I was a kid, I was in a real bad car accident. And I find I end up talking about this a lot in writer circles. Um, I would argue that most people have no idea that they're mortal. Because those of us that faced our mortality within that certain window of time when we're kids are definitely different. Um, we can often kind of recognize each other from comments that we will make in, at parties and things like that. I, I would argue that um, we're a small class of mortals. Most people are not do not come to terms um, with their mortality um, in that way. And I would argue that at any given moment in any, you know, as your mid flow in your day, you're not a more, you, you are living as if you're immortal. You're, you're not thinking about your demise. Um, people just don't. It's, um, people are so incredibly surprised when it's facing them down um, that, I just have a hard time believing that most people really are, have come to terms with the fact that they are fully immortal. That's really, really fascinating. I, I, I want to get back to that. 
Lou? I, I don't know how to top that. That was brilliant. I mean, I, I've got some ideas and questions myself, um, but I think it's dead on. Um, I'm Lou J. Berger. I'm a Denver-based author. I've written mostly short stories and science fiction and fantasy. Um, I did have a short story just come out in Bane and World Breakers. It's about sentient tanks. Um, I would choose immortality, um, kind of spinning off what Emily said, because it's hard for me to contemplate being mortal. And I know it's, I know it's a fact. Nobody gets out of this alive. But um, Emily, you bring up a strong point that folks don't focus on it. And so it makes me wonder about those last two, couple minutes when death is inevitable and you finally realize it and the, the anguish that must pour forth as you recognize that this is actually it, the thing you've dreaded your whole life is now here. Well, uh, way, way to, you know, way to bring it down, Lou. Sorry. Um, Courtney, <laughs> Courtney, go ahead. <laughs> I'd just like to point out that Lou and I have both committed one way or the other the other yeah. three of you have not said whether you would be take immortality or not. Okay, I will. I'll say okay. that. Um, Emily, when you were talking about uh, the experience of people who have had near and present realization that they are mortal, my thought about reading this particular question in the documentation was, I don't know that I am not immortal. Uh, it, it, my character in, in the novel is immortal and has forgotten. Right. In um, the literature of the great uh, Indian epics, you have instances where characters behave as though they're fully mortal characters until the plot requires them to suddenly remember, oh, as a matter of fact, I am Shiva, destroyer of worlds, right. or, or something of that sort. So with the idea that these perfectly mundane characters, well, not perfectly mundane characters, simply don't realize that they are Im immortal, my first reaction to that question, sir, is I don't know that I'm not immortal. I'm not Fair going enough. to behave as though I was, like, you know, jumping off ferry boats or rocking from trains. Uh, because I, I just don't know either way. Okay. I guess my take on it is I, I mean, I, I also used to be a lawyer, so I could go over all the clauses like, well, do you still age and, you know, things like that. And, um, but I, I would argue that a lot of the tropes about what is, um, bad about immortality, I, I don't think they're particularly well thought out. Um, some people do have one set of friends for their entire lives, but that's incredibly rare. Um, we will go through periods of time when a lot of our friends die. A lot of us are going to face that anyway. That's not necessarily something that's unique or, or more often, or like, more often, yes, but um, more intensely experienced if you're immortal. I mean, we're all going to outlive people that we love. So just saying that that's going to happen is that being some sort of deal breaker? Well, you know, that could happen to us during our mortal lives anyway. Um, the idea that we get bored, uh, you know, we are very singular in our focus as humans. And so I think if you look at a lot of very long lived, very contented people, they might've spent 20 years doing this and 30 years doing that. And, and I just think you probably could kite that for a really, really, really long time to where you don't really get bored with life. You, you just find different things to do and different ways to live. Um, but I guess my answer would be, I would prefer to know whether I'm mortal or immortal, so I could plan accordingly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could have some big plans. Yeah, I mean, you know, I you know have, it's different. When you <laughs> I should have prefaced my question by pointing out that, of course, you're all going to be immortal by virtue of your legacy. Um, <laughs> because this is such a stellar panel. So I should have been really clear about that. I mean, obviously your works and your reputations will endure <laughs> for millennia. I didn't mean to imply otherwise. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> You're welcome, Lou. Um, <laughs> yeah, Emily, so, um, you know, I, I sent some thoughts to the panel um, a few nights ago and Emily point, just um, brought, brought up one of these points, you know, it's a recurring trope in stories about immortals that um, there's sort of like this, it's this living death or this loneliness, this losing people, this growing dis disaffected or growing 
uh, detached from your fellow human beings. I mean, there are many, many, many stories about this. Um, but Emily, what about the, don't you, even if you are able to continue forming new relationships, don't you have to find something to live for in the long run? I think it's worth asking people what they live for now because the answers would probably surprise you. There's a lot of people that don't, that already aren't really living for anything in particular. Um, I would also argue that this idea, I mean, how many of us actually have, we might have one or two, but how many of us actually have that lifelong friend who knew us from when we were very little and still knows us today? That's a trope and it's a really great book character, but that's not who we typically have in our lives. I mean, people tend to drop out of our lives after you know a few years or a decade or so. And so I think it's entirely possible as an immortal to kite and nobody catch on to the fact that you're immortal. You might have a freak run in with somebody who knew you 40 years ago, but they're not gonna recognize you out of context. So um, I think that it's predicated on this very static idea of human relationships that isn't actually how we live. I mean, we already live with the sort of immortal habit of forming new bonds as we move into different phases of our lives. Um, we might have one lifelong uh, marriage partner, but only about half of us have that. So, yeah. But as far as living for, I, I would argue, if you ask a lot of people what they live for, they don't have much. It, it's interesting, the answers or how transitory those answers are. Like a lot of people will live for their kids. Okay, I mean, and when they're little, yes, absolutely. But that's a very transitory thing. Panelists, what do you think? What do you think about this? This is a very interesting perspective. <clears throat> well, I think uh, I, I think Emily's correct because you know I called and talked to a a kid I grew up with. We first met about seventy years ago. You know. We talk maybe now every 10 years, we'll get together or something. But I've known Rick for all my life, but he's not one of my close friends today. You know, I, I think we do make new friendships and move along throughout our lives. And the people I know and I'm, stuff now are not the same people that I knew 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, I may still know them, but they're not as close as they once were. And I think you're right there, Emily. I don't, I don't think that's a reason for not wanting immortality, you know, because I think we, we're doing that all the time, or we should be making new friends and stuff. And not that we discard the old ones, they just don't remain as active as they once were. And you might not find out that they've passed on for months yeah, until after right. it happened, you know, yeah. Lou, what do you think? I, I, was, I was gonna phrase this question in the terms of romance, we, but there is a difference between transitory friendships, like Emily was talking about, and romance. And I was thinking about how an immortal would approach romance. And I think as a young man, we're driven by hormones and, and, and such. Uh, but after two, three hundred years, is romance still even viable? And I suspect it is not. Um, we live now, each of us, each of us mortals, until proven otherwise. Um, in sliding windows of time. And our lives span eight decades, maybe nine if we're lucky. And we are comfortable surrounding ourselves with people who coexist in those same windows of sliding time. Sex is fun, don't get me wrong, but it, I don't believe it's enough for an immortal's needs. Sex is easy to get, but companionship is difficult. After how many spouses is enough enough? Four, eight? Henry VIII was an anomaly. Eventually, I'm convinced every immortal learns to be happy in their own skins, alone in the world, but for transitory friends. And I think that like shuffling cards in a deck, we gather about us the friends that help us grow and lift us like balloons in that particular part of our life. And I suspect that those are segments, those are episodes of our lives that uh, we can continue indefinitely because hopefully we would continue to learn and grow even as we are immortal. 
that's beautiful and profoundly optimistic. <laughs> Lou, you and I are two very different people. <laughs> I, know, I know, it's okay. <laughs> that's beautiful. Susan, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, I am, maybe I don't put as much value on uh, interpersonal relationships as, uh, as I ought. Uh, I do have a couple of friends uh, that I've known since I was 11 or 12 years old. And that's a, a long, long time when you get to be a white haired little old lady like I am. Uh, and uh, as you, as you say, Emily, it, and, and, <laughs> and gentlemen, uh, they may have be friends that you've known since you were knee high to a grasshopper. And that doesn't mean that you still live on such terms of intimacy that each other's company is of difference for you between a happy life and an unhappy life. But um, it's the issue of boredom really that uh, yes. sticks on me because I love the idea of having uh, 276,000 years to go watch uh, erosion on an island in Iceland or to learn how to make quilts or, oh, I could play the violin, but the um, in, it would seem that the inescapable uh, problem that I see is that after you've spent all of the time that you can to extract the maximum satisfaction pleasure, joy, and usefulness to uh, human communities or non-human communities, then you still have the rest of eternity uh, in which you've got to find something to do. Um, so for me, the question of aren't you gonna get bored uh, is probably the uh, single most important point because if you're immortal, no matter how many years you spend doing anything, it is still, compared to the rest of your life, a drop in the bucket. <laughs> time doesn't end. If your time never ends, it doesn't matter how much you find to do with your time. Sooner or later, you're going to run out. Forever is a do. very long time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What were you going to say there? Uh, no, I was just uh, uh, qualifying that... Uh, so, sooner or later you're going to run out dot 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 of uh, things to do yeah yes yeah, I, yeah I, that's all i think so i mean that um i'm glad you brought that up susan because i um in my notes here i have to myself you know when we're and 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 emily actually hinted at this um a bit as well you know when we talk about immortality it's hard to conceive of actual immortality, which is why I loved your answer, Susan, where you mentioned, I would love to have 276,000 years to watch erosion at work. Forever is a very, very long time. So when we're talking about immortality, do we really mean forever? Um, you know, there, I come from a science background, and so I can imagine a hard boundary condition, right? When the sun becomes a red giant and swallows the earth, you can't live if, if the molecules in your body can't stay together anymore. But, you know, that's doesn't matter what I think. Um, uh, and that, that brings me to um, Karen Travis uh, wrote this series of novels, the West Horror novels. I don't know, panelists, if you're familiar with these. Um, really great books. Um, and they, the central plot device is that um, there's this, uh, sort of symbiotic parasite that can give someone extremely high resilience and sort of a damage recovery. Um, but then instead of using that to tell like an action adventure story, she gets into the moral and ethical implications of what that would do to a person and to the people around them. So panelists, do you, do you think that an immortal person walking through our world would have any kind of moral or ethical obligations laid upon them by the fact of their existence? I have strong feelings about that. Great. <laughs> yes. So everybody, I assume. No, it's just seen... a yes or no question. Oh, it is? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, everybody saw Groundhog Day, right? Everybody has seen that <laughs> yeah. movie, Groundhog yeah. Day? Um, no, it's uh, the, the premise is that uh, Bill Murray, the main character, wakes up every morning and it's the same morning 
every morning. The, the clock radio plays the same song and he, everything is exactly the same. And he navigates his way through this repetitive day over and over and over and over again. It happens to be Groundhog Day, hence the title of the movie. Um, but I found interesting, and I don't mean to give this away, Susan, I don't want to spoil her, but um, he starts off, he's an angry, cynical man. He's an angry, cynical weatherman who just doesn't care about anybody but himself in the beginning of the movie. And of course, when he finds that he's caught in this hopeless loop, he finds a variety of ways to kill himself and yet wakes up the next morning, which is the same morning every time. <laughs> and we are left by extrapolation to assume that he probably kills himself hundreds, if not thousands of times. They only show a, a small segment of those. But what's interesting, and this is an answer to your question, Ian, what's interesting is he eventually decides, since it's futile to kill himself, to become the best person he knows how to be to everybody he encounters during that fateful day. And the unfolding of this doing good for others, selflessly, truly selflessly doing good resonates strongly with me. And this is why I was thinking um, that, that if, you, if we live our lives selfish, huddled, afraid of the rain, afraid of darkness, because that's how we are as mortals, and you know that that darkness will never come, it makes sense, and this is where Ian and I, again, <laughs> with the cynicism and the optimism, split ways. Um, I, I believe that, that a person who is immortal would spend all of their waking time finding ways to quietly and anonymously give of themselves and improve the lots of those around them, just like uh, the character does in Groundhog Day. Emily? Well, I was going to say, um, have you seen Palm Springs? No. You need to watch Palm Springs because is it a also, series? No, Palm Springs is another movie where they begin. Um, it's a Groundhog Day type story, but when they begin, one person has already been in the loop for a really long time, and so okay. it makes for a really funny opening exposition as this day is just going crazily sideways, and this person seems to know what's going to happen, <laughs> but okay. there's other random stuff happening. Um, and one of the things I thought was really interesting in Palm Springs is um, a few people get end up end up in this time loop. Um, and they kind of come to the conclusion that um, they know they're going to wake up the next morning. They, they've killed themselves a gazillion times. They've tried staying up, um, <laughs> talk about taking crystal meth and getting as far as I forget, Papua New Guinea or something like that and, until they fall asleep and, and things like that. But they also come to the conclusion that they need to avoid hurting other people. Other people, this is you know, this is the only time they're going to experience this day. So you don't make it a bad day for people. You don't, you know, you don't hurt people. They'll hurt themselves <laughs> in all kinds of crazy ways. Um, and then, you know, it takes a while for that rule to develop. I mean, it, it, the the movie very cleverly goes through all kinds of iterations of like, if you do have all the time in the world, what do you do? Um, and it, you know, they pretty much, if you can think of it, they do it in that, in that movie or they refer to having done it. Um, I have... And maybe we can come back to this question later, but um, in what age do you look like you are in your immortality? Because I do have opinions about looking a lot younger than you are, um, or at least getting mistaken for a lot younger than you are. It's not as fun as you think, because <laughs> it's something that I've, I've dealt with all my life. I, I think that brings up, <clears throat> it seems like in literature and everything, there's kind of three kinds of immortality. There's kind of the magic immortality, and, and that's what we have in Groundhog Day. You know, no matter what he does, drive the car 90 miles an hour into a brick wall, he's going to wake up in the morning. Okay. So immortality that you can't die, nothing's, you know, you're going to be around forever. The second kind of immortality is kind of like uh, the fountain of youth or uh, tuck everlasting or something. I'm on a hike up in the mountains and I come across a little uh, a spring and I take a drink and that drink gives me immortality. My physiology changes. I'm never going to age anymore. That would be nice, you know, uh, and stuff. But I am going to live forever. But 
if I do something stupid like getting in a car, driving 90 miles an hour into a brick wall, I am going to die, you know. And the third kind of immortality <clears throat> is um, the kind where you're immortal, you're going to live forever, but you are going to age, okay? And never and, stop aging. And never stop aging. And, and that's the kind of immortality uh, in Gulliver's Travels <laughs> and stuff. Susan? A thought has occurred to me. Alert the National Guard. Um, uh, Emily, when you're talking about, you know, discussing uh, the uh, program uh, and the decision that people make to spend their time uh, trying to not make things worse for the people that they meet at, at minimum, made me think about the fact that if I was immortal, maybe maybe wonder about an element of the subjective experience of being immortal if i was immortal i would i have the subjective time to relate to any given person what i mean is i'm umpty ump years old and time seems to move more quickly with every year it's that thing, you know, we've all done the mind experiment, I expect, of saying when I was 10 years old, one year is a tenth of my life. And when I'm 50 years old, and so on and so forth, each passing year is a smaller and smaller percent of my life. So here I am sitting, it's August, uh, I see. And in terms of subjectivity, and maybe never paying attention to where I am and what I'm doing, uh, St. Patrick's Day was the day before yesterday, and Christmas is the day after tomorrow. And that's just at my age of <laughs> So if I had the subjective experience of immortality and I was unable to hide from myself knowledge that I was immortal, then um, my perception of time uh, is going to really collapse and it's going to get denser and denser as a perception as time goes on. I could babble and I'd better not. I hope to not be babbling. Thank you. No, this is fascinating stuff. Please do not worry. Share your <laughs> thoughts with us. This is why I say you're all going to live, you're going to have a long legacy, all of you. Um, yeah, I. there are so many caveats. Um, you know, Susan, you and Courtney you've brought up these issues. There are, there are really a lot of caveats in terms of what how it works and what the subjective experience, objectively and subjectively, what the experience of the immortality would be. Um, uh, and I, yeah, and so it makes me a little bit squeamish. Um, I, I'm curious, um, it, regardless of how it was bestowed upon us, um, there would be a number of challenges, I think. Um, at least in the first couple of lifetimes, as you try to figure the whole thing out. Um, and Susan, I know you had mentioned you, you, um, you've written about immortals. What are the, can you kind of summarize for us some of the challenges that you envisioned for these characters? And I know Emily, you've done this as well. So I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, these, uh, the challenges could be divided roughly into uh, those facing um, a supernatural creature and those facing a non-supernatural creature. Um, all of the uh, Chinese immortals that I have met in uh, stories have been of the supernatural creature variety. Uh, the uh, hidden dragon advisor is in fact a dragon, even though in history it was just taken to be a description of a uh, kind of personality. So the challenges for somebody who is not a supernatural type creature, but uh, somebody who is otherwise mortal in all aspects, it, they, those are gonna be actually more complicated than being a supernatural creature who is immortal. And I think that uh, in the material that you sent us in to start thinking about the uh, issues that might arise, uh, I think that a lot of those are of the 
gosh darn it, if I woke up tomorrow morning and realized that I was immortal, uh, what would I need to do uh, to survive successfully? And those are issues uh, like, where am I gonna get my money? Uh, what happens to my social security number? Am I going to continue to prove that I'm a I have a legal existence and so on and so forth? Whereas if I'm a supernatural creature, then um, I'm kind of like, uh, all bets are off anyway. I'm not gonna have to worry about uh, how I'm going to make my living and get enough money to live on if people don't believe that I'm actually here in the first place. I'm sorry, I don't think that made much sense. No, I get you, I get you. The resource issue is a very interesting question. Um, and I want to I want to get into that, Emily. Does that come up in your treatment? Well, so um, my immortals, um, you know, they're like they're like vampires with souls that um, they have to be doing good things. They have to be serving other people. Um, if they lose touch with that, they they're they're possessed by another entity, and this other entity will take take them over. And so that's it's got that boundary condition on it. It makes it very different than what we're talking about. Um, one thing I will say though is that. Um, dealing with uh, YA romance where there is a massive age difference, um, the way I dealt with that is when, when somebody's been immortal long enough, they kind of, will, you know, well, we'll kind of blank out like the drive to the grocery store. They might blank out like a century here and there. You know, they, they live it, they do stuff, but it's like routine that enough. That, and so um, what, the, um, what the main character does is she helps wake up a guy who's just sort of been going through the motions for a long enough time that he's sort of coming to conscious life again um, in the story. And so that they have enough in that sort of coming of age aspect to talk about that, that, that they have that in common. Um, but yeah, I also, I was sort of putting my hand up earlier. I, I think it's also note, worth noting that all of us on this panel are white or white passing um, and are from a very wealthy, from the wealthiest country that's ever existed on the planet and are you know, in the global 1%. Um, and so I'm kind of curious what other people from very different lived experiences would feel about this. And I also wonder how blind we are to the really tough times that we might be in for in future eras and future societies. Um, you know, I, like the show Timeless, one thing I thought that, that they did that I thought was brilliant is the only guy who can fly the time machine is a black guy. And he's like, no, <laughs> no, thank you. I'm not, I'm not flying a time machine. He's like, there is no time I can go to that is awesome for me. Um, and they yeah, that's like a quote that. from the show, which is yeah, awesome. It's, it was, yeah, it was, just, and, and they dealt with that really well. Like um, as they're trying to preserve the timeline, having to go um, preserve the Lincoln assassination and seeing the beginning of the, of the post-Civil War era and seeing what is going to be destroyed when, when Lincoln is assassinated. Um, you know, times when he's able to stealth around in ways that his white, colleagues can't. Um, and so I, I think that even, even if we live to a ripe old age in our society, we will still only have a teeny tiny glimpse of what it was like to be human. That there's no, that, that experience is so incredibly multifaceted. Um, you know, will the gender that we are exist as we know it a few societies from now. And I'm not, I'm not saying that to be edgy or anything like that. Gender has changed a lot down through time and through eons and through societies. I had thought exactly about what you're saying, what you're talking about. And if you're a person of color and you're in the 1900s, 1800s, 1700s, it, get, it goes back, then your experience wouldn't be the same as this mostly white uh, panel. I, and I would be illegal. I am passing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the, it, it wasn't until almost 1970 that women could live alone safely without being, you know, cast out by society, had to have a man somewhere in there. And it's just unfortunate that, that we, that we have that kind of approach to one another. One of the notes I had taken was, um, if you had immortality, you would have to overcome all your biases over time, racism, bigotry, all things learned in youth, because everybody immortal has to have had a youth, uh, must be rooted out and cast aside, which dovetails with being good to people on a daily basis because it's really the only way you can spend your time fruitfully, I believe. You imagine a serial killer with millions of victims? I, I don't see how that would work. Well, uh, so having done some elder law, in my experience, it's actually people who are facing their death fairly young who developed the magnanimous, you know, 
if you only have another day left on earth make it a good one and it's actually the people who are the some of the oldest um and often haven't faced a whole lot of adversity in their lives who are some of the most selfish and the most impossible to work with and you know it's good to be kicking and screaming (laughs) um all the way to whatever assisted living facility they need to they need to go to now um so i mean while philosophically i understand what you're saying my live my practical experience has been opposite for what it's worth well you mentioned the lack of adversity as being a significant contributor yes. to that yeah. and i'm wondering it, it you you've experienced death almost right and 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 are you empathetic or are you grumpy at, at people do have you learned optimistic empathy after yeah. your experience? Yeah. I mean, and I'm like a lot of people who've been through the experience is that um, every day, you really do realize every day is a gift. None of yeah. this is guaranteed. None of this is owed to you. No, you know, none of this is... Um, you're not entitled. You're not entitled. If tomorrow you don't wake up, who are you going to sue? Who are you going to complain to? You, you're, you know, <laughs> I, and I, um, I am myself religious, but I'm also perfectly comfortable with aware of the idea that maybe I won't even exist <laughs> as an entity um, at that point. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I, so I kind of wonder how much adversity, it depends on what kind of mortal you are, but how much adversity certain kinds of mortals have if they never really seriously face death. And if they don't have the empathy to care when they're, you know, if they never are close enough to a friend to really be torn when that person dies. I, you know, I, I just, I've seen a lot of examples of people who can go a really long time without ever developing that. I believe that, and and I and I sympathize with that. And I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm thinking that things that are absolutely improbable, the longer you live, the more likely they would happen yeah. to you. You know, how sure. many times will an immortal have been hit by lightning? I've never been hit by lightning. Has anybody here been hit by lightning? But if you're ten thousand years old, you're going to get hit by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> not sure I agree on the math on that, but I get your point. Yeah. Okay. A hundred thousand years. Fine. Fine. <laughs> Ian. I, I do think How tall is the average? Like, I, go ahead, Courtney. Some, I'm sorry. I do think I read somewhere that even if we were immortal, say we were all born immortal, we'd still have a life expectancy because of what Lou just said. Some people are going to get hit by lightning and die, you know, if it's not the magic kind of immortality. Uh, Some people are going to fall off a ladder and die. There's going to be accidents. There's car accidents every day. Emily's mentioned this and stuff. So I, someone had did a, had done a, a rough approximation and uh, the lifespan would be about 500 years. Wow. So that's the actuarial take on immortality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, I didn't do the math, and I don't know if they're right, but I did think it was interesting that someone did sit down to try and figure this out, that you know, even if our bodies would go on forever and ever, if we're capable of dying, we probably will. That sounds like an actuary somewhere as like but a- how, how different is that from what we already experience? I mean, we're, we're always evolved, you know, um, getting better. I mean, the period we're living in now, we're getting better from medical technology that we live well past what our natural life's been. Yeah, well, in that, you know. but, but we're not to 500 years yet, Emily. Not to 500 years now. Yeah, I mean, the longest documented human lifespan is what, about 120 years? And that's comprehensible. It's amazing, but it's comprehensible. 200 years, 300 years, 500 years, to me anyway, as a a lived experience becomes incomprehensible to me. Um, Courtney, I was going to ask you, um, if I were to become, if I wanted to become Lou's eternal altruist, I'm going to need resources to do it. this is really a question for all of you, but I'll start with Courtney. Um, those of you who have thoughts on this, how do you do that? Like nobody wants to live for 500 years in abject squalor, but you don't have the, if, if you didn't have the benefit of knowing what's going to come forward, right? You don't have precognition. 
all you know is that you're going to be here for the long run. How do you ensure that you have resources? I mean, and you have to take the very long, well, now we're talking like the, the really long view, right? It's not just like, oh, I'll put money in the stock market and wait a hundred years. You have to think about, is that economy going to exist? Is that country going to exist? What is the social order going to be? How do you, I don't know. I, I, I have no answer for this one. What about you, Courtney? I, I don't either. I, I do. I obviously <laughs> yeah, know I do too. how to make a million dollars when I was young. When I'm old, I don't know how to make a million dollars either. But, uh, you know, I, I think if you're immortal, you've got to live through the time. And I don't think you would necessarily live through the time as a millionaire forever and ever. You know, uh, for part of your life, you may be well off, uh, but you invested all your money into the German stock market, you know, in 1900. And by 1930, you were broke, you know. Those kinds of things are going to happen. I'm not sure that you can assure forever. You'd have to continually be thinking about bringing in some money. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that um, uh, putting myself in the brain of a one kind of immortal, if I can say this without with meaning no disrespect. I would say that is such a newbie question. How am I going to, you know, nobody wants to live in squalor and so forth. Well, that's true for me, but I have a finite lifespan uh, to, uh, uh, and I would like to leave it comfortably. If I was an immortal, I would propose that I'm not going to notice. I've got, you know, I, I, I live forever. Any particular moment, any particular lifespan is is the uh, proverbial drop in, in the bucket and the bucket is the uh, Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean and then every other ocean that there is in creation include, okay, <laughs> there I go. Uh, so I think that uh, my first thought is that uh, I am probably actually not going to be spending a lot of time worrying about that once I've gotten accustomed to the idea that no matter how awful or wonderful it is, it's going to be over in half of a breath compared to the to the span of time. I'll just say briefly that the um, the immortal in this novel didn't uh, set out to become immortal. He didn't wake up and realize he was immortal and his money uh, his uh, material support has come from the fact that he knew how to do something. Uh, he, he can perform medicine. So he had a skill, but also because where he came from, when he came from, these were precious objects. Let's just call them rutabagas. We'll pretend. So he liked rutabagas. And over the course of time in this fantasy novel, uh, rutabagas appreciated. So he had them in his kitchen because he liked them and, and they suddenly, relatively suddenly became very expensive objects. I, I like what you said because one of my notes that I judged myself was the speculation that over centuries, maybe many of the worldly concerns would sort of melt away. Um, and what became important, you know, when you're 500 years old, what's important might not be what's important to you when you're 60. Um, so I, I, I do like the idea that this could be a new question. I think that's a great perspective. <laughs> well, I am. Um, I also think that we have a, a very simplistic understanding of history. There aren't actually a lot of Mount Vesuvius moments. I mean, when societies fall, you're usually talking about an upper class, uh, a small percentage having a, a massive upheaval in their way of life or whatever. But, but these great empires that have fallen, I mean, the people go on and i th i would think that as an immortal if you go play it by the numbers there's a fairly good chance you're just you aren't caesar you aren't you know the kinds of people whose catastrophic upheavals are are marked as the end of a civilization you're just you know like the farmers who 
go from being slaves to the Romans to being serfs in the Germanic tribes. You know, I mean, um, so I think the way we learn history is as condensed like eras and eras ending and societies falling and stuff like that. I don't, it, it doesn't, I don't think that's actually the lived experience of the people who go through these falls. I think, you know, you don't necessarily realize that your civilization has fallen until you're several hundred years out and you're looking back, you're like, oh, well, we did used to do, we did used to be richer and we did used to do more audacious things. I mean, when the electricity stops running and the water stops flowing, I think people will notice that. I mean, but that's assuming that our way of life completely ends and doesn't transition to anything else. I mean, I hope it does. Yeah, but... I mean, and I think the lived experience of somebody who had actually lived through all the eras of history, I mean, on the whole, you got this upward trend in technology and 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 so on and so forth. I mean, you've there have been blips and such in the path, but um, this, this apocalyptic catastrophic end, I, most, most societies don't really end that way with a bang. Hey, I agree with Emily's point of view completely. Um, thinking through it, you know, ahead of time. As the immortal bard Mick Jagger says, time <laughs> is on my side. And I, I think that if, if you're going to be immortal, then you would have a diverse portfolio, including real estate. They don't make, you know, except in Hawaii, they don't make real estate anymore. And um, things that the rutabagas, for example, that society finds valuable, um, it could be gold, it could be gems, and then until someone recognizes that diamonds are as plentiful as gravel, then diamonds will no longer have value. So it, it, diversification makes sense. And I agree completely, Emily, that, that for somebody who lives comfortably, comfortably for our modern Western societal standard, there's no reason why you couldn't live comfortably almost in any civilized country around the world. And eat three square meals, sleep under a roof, have a nice bed, warm, cool, when appropriate. You know, I think, I think she's right. I think that's the point. Um, and it, think about this. Most people manage to cram together enough money or people that love them to support them uh, in a short 40 or years or so of, of work to gather a retirement. You imagine having 10 times that amount. The, the trick is to get rid of some of the money without calling attention to yourself. After 500 years, I'm thinking you're going to be fabulously wealthy. Look at the royal families. But, you know, but again, that, right, that's a very, that's a one perspective, right? In, yep. in the culture, um, you know, in, you know, in this predominantly white panel, right? To say, yeah, in 40 years, we get a retirement and all that. Um, not true for a lot of people. I get that. What if um, we become a class that can't own property? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I yes, get, yes. But, but but like, you know, for example, ever since a wheel was invented, people have had wheels. You know, ever since, yeah. you know, huts were invented, you know, there may be nicer and, and, and not so nice huts, but there is just generally an upward trend despite the blips. Right. Um, Courtney's... Um... Boy, the time's really flying. Courtney's theoretical um, theoretical actuary working out the statistical 500-year life expectancy um, got me thinking about, um, so we've been talking about this resource issue, um, but I, I, I keep, in my mind, keep coming back to Courtney's actuary thinking someone made this person work this out because someone's going to crack immortality someday, right? And there are, um, in the notes that I made for this panel, you know, there are these Silicon Valley billionaires who are working on the problem right now. Um, I mean, talk about coming from a position of privilege, right? I've, you know, I'm a multi, multi-billionaire. I can have anything I want. I'm going to conquer death because it's the last thing I can't have. And so um, people like Larry Ellison and the co-founders of Google and the co-founder of PayPal have sunk together over a billion dollars into anti-aging research. Um, you know, um, Larry, uh, Page and Sergey Brin, who are the co-founders of Google, threw three quarters of a billion dollars into a genomics company they created with the stated goal of curing aging. Um, uh, and it, I, I guess they're making progress on this. Lou, I know you've been giving quite a lot of thought to, um, since you've been doing so much research on this on the side, I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about telomeres and um, the relationship between aging and anti-aging treatments and uh, chromosomal biology. Everybody here knows what telomeres are? Yep. 
I figured, Susan, I don't mean to talk over you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, so the, the telomeres are basically extra lengths of genetic material that because the division, cell division lops off a little segment at the end, the longer your telomeres, historically, the more times that that particular cell can divide. And when the telomeres grow short, um, senescence and aging of that cell allow creates a scenario where it can't d- divide again and it dies. And that is what, according to the latest theories, that's what aging is. It's basically senescence or cell death because the telomeres have finally given up their ability to replicate. Um, so tel- telomerase is an enzyme that theoretically adds genetic material to the telomeres that are in place. And Henrietta Lacks, we can't have an immortality kind of without talking about Henrietta Lacks. Um, she had, she died at the age of 31 of uh, adenocarcinoma of the uterus, cervix, cervix. And the, the tumor that was extracted, the cells live on, they divide very quickly. And they, because of the telomere, telomerase that these cells create, when they divide, they divide without telomere loss. And so they are still alive in the, in, the, in the labs. They can be replicated. People all over the world have what they call HeLa, Henrietta Lacks, H-E-L-A, cells. And they're, they're being investigated <clears throat> even now for how to counteract aging. Uh, they're, she's immortal, or at least her cells are immortal. And that's because of this, this unique combination, absolutely happened by circumstance, uh, of, of her cells being able to divide rapidly with enough telomerase to keep the telomeres intact. All that to say that that is a form of immortality. I just don't know the quality of life that one would have. And that's key. Emily, I think that you had mentioned something about that earlier. When you become immortal in whatever this hypothetical scenario is, are you strong and functional? Do you appear to be 20, 25? Are you, are you ache-free or are you in your 80s and 90s and, and crippled with arthritis and can't see glaucoma, et cetera? Um, you know, is immortality worth it if if your body is on the verge of everybody else's death, but yet you linger on, you know, or do you look like you're 25 and you've got people centuries younger, younger than you talking down to you? (laughs) I mean, because that is, that is a part of your lived experience too. And that is, um, that's, that's a stereotype of Asians and part Asians. Um, but I, I mean, it's something I've faced a lot in my life. People think I'm a lot younger than I am. Um, you know, it's, it's different. I think it's something that people don't necessarily take into account what that lived experience is. I agree. Did I answer you, Ian? Did I answer that question? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, because you've been giving so much thought to Telmarie's that I I wanted to make sure we got it into the conversation in the last, I think we're down to our last two minutes. Panel, you've all been so fascinating and I wish we could talk for another hour. Um, I'd like to wrap this up on time so that our uh, disembodied, moderator doesn't uh, super moderator doesn't uh, cut us off um I'll, I'll try to wrap up with a final question for you all what would you do in your first 100 years and your first 200 years of immortality lou you're on camera i am oh <laughs> hi <laughs> i think in my first 100 years i would i would probably probe the extent of what the immortality actually means and, and understand what my responsibility to this gift uh, actually is. And then probably begin the, the, the long process of establishing a way for me to disappear into society. Because I think if you can be hit by lightning and you will be hit by lightning, somebody out there who's going to die and knows it will be jealous enough of my immortality to come hunt me down and end me. Just like what's his name who killed John Lennon? He didn't do it because he disliked John Lennon. He just wanted to be famous. That's the theory, at least, right? So I'd say I, the first hundred years, I would, I would figure out a way to disappear, and uh, I would make myself useful. And I don't know that that would be different for the second hundred years. Susan, I would first seek the Northwest Passage where the icy hand of Franklin reaches for the Beaufort Sea. (laughs) Because there are some things that are part of my personal, you know, history that may not survive that much longer, like the Northwest Passage as a concept. Um, 
And I had, I'm sure, I'm sure I had something intelligent to say, and I'm sorry, it's gone. <laughs> it's getting late. Courtney, what about you? <clears throat> well, I, I kind of scared myself silly uh, preparing for this panel, uh, reading Gulliver's Travels. <laughs> and uh, I recommend people read Gulliver's Travels and uh, uh, the comments about, I think it's the Struhlberg people who uh, are immortal and how scary that is. Sounds like my kind of, my kind of reading. Yeah. It was yeah. U-boats. The next thousand years, I'm going to understand U-boats. Okay. All right. U-boats. <laughs> Emily, U-boats? Uh, you know, U-boats for you too? I've, I've got little kids. I mean, so I'm thinking I would be watching my descendants, just seeing what happens um, just down, down through the ages. Um, I also think I could work 200 years on writing and still have a lot to learn. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think all. it helps to have been kind of bad at my, at my passion for my whole life that you know 20 years in i'm like yes i'm finally starting to get these things you know i i could see defending 200 years on this <laughs> <laughs> you're all such beautiful optimists uh this has been good for my soul on this panel um and i think we're just about at our time so i want to thank I, you all for... before we go ahead start, Carl, however all the rest of us have said whether we would want to be immortal or not except for you ian oh i think we're out of time uh, <laughs> this is no way he is immortal <laughs> my answer is no way there's no scenario in which i would accept immortality not one because i don't want to live the only living i don't i don't want to be the only living being on an in um um in an inhos inhospitable planet i don't want to be the only living thing on earth mm. so no way there's no way i would, I would take it it would be super lonely it really would be yeah, I, the thought of it just, I can't even take the thought of it. Um, and I think that's what a true immortal would face. On that happy note, uh, <laughs> I think we are out of time. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you both. Thank you, everybody. Thank you yeah, for this hosting. Yeah, this is great. Ian.